<laughs> so welcome to the science fiction stream. So where we get to discuss the topic du jour, which, um, well, we, 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 we sometimes get to the topic du jour, don't we? <laughs> Quite often, eventually. <laughs> now, I really rather like uh, Jaten 666 uh, idea there, that if the topic of the day is being off topic, then can I actually be off topic, given that the topic of the day would be off topic? <laughs> I'm not sure whether that would work or not, but that's quite a cunning plan. I, I quite like that. That's, that's definitely my sort of, that's my sort of cunning. Um, anyway, lovely to see you all. So Alan's here, JR1988 is here, Glenn is here, Terra Firma, um, Commander O'Connor, Jaten's here, Lucky Luigi's here, Poffis is here, Sophia is here, Dunpeel is here, um, J69713PB. You need a better username, sir. <laughs> Am I supposed to pronounce that? <laughs> Danny Vega is here as well. <laughs> Lovely to see you all on a Monday afternoon. Uh, Monday evening. Well, Monday afternoon, Monday Monday lunchtime, depending on where you are in the world. So uh, there we go. So um, um, uh, Jay Allen here has a, to has a question that will bring it back around to being on topic. Off, on topically off topic. <laughs> Topics actually are a very nice chocolate bar in the UK. Well, at least they used to be. Can you still get a topic? Does anybody know? <laughs> Which may sound strange because um, actually it won't work. Probably won't work outside the UK. Actually, a topic used to be a, a chocolate bar. There was a there was a chocolate topic bar, um, uh, or candy, candy, candy. What do you call it in America, isn't it? Um, I never understood the word candy. I think we've talked about that before. Anyway, candy. It's a chocolate bar called Topic. So I could be on Topic, <laughs> talking about chocolate. Uh, but I don't know if, I hate nothing every bite. That's right. Oh, jeez. Hey, jeez. The base is here as well. So. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I could be on topic. We were talking about chocolate. It still is. It, can you still? I haven't seen one for years. Can you still get topics? Excellent. I might have to go, I'm have to go get myself one now, just to show you, just to show you what the topic actually is. <laughs> then we could be on topic all evening. In fact, if I, if if we all got topic bars, we could all be on topic all evening. That would be really good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hello, chat. Says so CB bit. Um, I used to like topic bars. <laughs> <laughs> <Top> topic. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> ah, that's good. It's good. It's a bit like it's a bit like Terry Wogan, actually. This is. <laughs> this can you keep true? And anywhere, anywhere, even closely, approximately, anywhere close to the, the topic that he was actually supposed to be talking about. The answer is mostly no. So that's good. Anyway, Alan, Alan's here. Well, then the actually topic bars were good. What were they? Were they were hate? They were nutty with a sort of caramelly toffee thing on top with chocolate around it. I, I do recall them being quite nice. Um, topic, to topic bars. Um, so, but um, yeah, it's been a while since I had one. Um, maybe, 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 maybe chocolate. I am convinced actually that in all my years, now I've been on this planet, as you know, for 50 years. And um, I have come to the conclusion that humanity's two greatest inventions, you know, across the entire spectrum of everything that we as a, as, a, as a species have accomplished, the two things I think are the best are chocolate and vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and I will, I, will, I, will, I will fight my corner on this, okay? You can forget about cars and you can forget about um, airplanes and you can forget about atomic nuclear fusion, you know, chocolate and ice cream. Vanilla ice cream, I, I hasten to add, because it's, it's important to have vanilla ice cream. Those two, and then those two together are in fact perfection. There, there is no greater um, height to which we need to uh, climb than, than chocolate and vanilla ice cream. <laughs> so those, those, those that, that is my, that is, that is my, um, yeah, I've summarised. We, we, we have achieved greatness already. I don't know when chocolate and vanilla ice cream were invented, but I, 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 don't, I don't think we've topped those, really, let's be honest. Unless, unless you maybe count a little bit of sort of raspberry sauce, perhaps. That, that, that's, that's, that's one way to top vanilla ice cream. <laughs> Lion bars with nuts. Yeah. Um, I was seeing, yeah, so another round of distraction. Yes, this is very common. This is, this is how we start on Mondays, I'm afraid. Um, um, JL19 actually has a writing related question. Really? Um, I do, <laughs> when you've gotten my work in progress to the stage where I think I need to hire an editor, does Drew or anyone else here have any advice on that, even recommendations? Um, hiring an editor, okay, uh, let me have a think about this. Um, basically the, 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 the editor needs to not, uh, needs to have two things. Not only do they have to have editing, editing credentials, i.e. you know, they know their stuff in terms of editing. They have to be, um, they have to be aware of what you're trying to do. So they have to be somebody who 
gets the genre you're working in and also gets your type of storytelling. Um, so I would be tempted to find an editor who is familiar with, um, let's say, science fiction. If you're writing in science fiction, I would, I'd be tempted to, 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 um, to find somebody who fits into that sort of genre and then see what else they've edited. You know, most of them will have a sort of portfolio of things and see what else they've kind of worked on. I think probably editing science fiction and or fantasy is a little bit specialist because you kind of need to know, <laughs> know some of the tropes of the of, of the genre and all that kind of good stuff. So that, that would be my advice. Um, if other people have got advice, then please, please do let me know. That's really good. Um, Commander O'Connor says, I've lived in the US for six years and when my delivery of real tea bags, real tea bags. Um, I, I had to have a British chocolate since American stuff. So, you know, and chocolate actually is very different across the world. So, you know, um, we have to we have to differentiate chocolate. Uh, maybe this, this is my, dis, my, my distinction. Now, um, most, to be honest, most of what most of the world thinks is chocolate actually isn't chocolate. Um, it's got so much other stuff in it that it's not really chocolate. In fact, um, uh, there are places in Europe that uh, will not call what we call chocolate actually chocolate is actually it's, you know, it's, it's not similar enough to be called chocolate because um, um, in the UK and I probably in the US uh, we put a lot of vegetable oil uh, we put vegetable oil into chocolate to kind of water it down um, presumably make it cheaper um, and um, depending on the amount of vegetable oil you put into your chocolate bar a it sort of does change the taste a little bit but B, it, it, it effectively dilutes it. So you may remember, if you're young, sorry, if you're old, or yeah, let's say, actually, if, if you're young, you probably think of chocolate as something that is quite sort of malleable at room temperature. Um, I.e. it's soft, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not a hard thing. Um, whereas in the olden days, <laughs> when I were a lad, um, chocolate is supposed to crack, okay? So proper chocolate cracks at room temperature. The stuff that we have nowadays, most of us, doesn't crack at room temperature because it's not actually chocolate. It's got chocolate in it, but it's watered down with vegetable oil. Um, so if you if you buy proper chocolate, uh, and the best place to get that that I know is actually from Belgium, um, uh, then um, then um, it will actually crack at room temperature. The only way to get the stuff that we have in the UK to crack at room temperature is to put it in the fridge, which then obviously isn't room temperature anymore. <laughs> At least it isn't for very long. And then you can get that kind of old school chocolate crack, uh, which is what chocolate's supposed to be like. Um, so um, <laughs> there you go. A small lesson on chocolate. Um, uh, Nicole from... Um, I uh, went off them after I heard the, the joke. What's <laughs> a hazelnut in every bite to squirrel poo? Ah, no, no. Let's not go there, Jase. <laughs> um, so real chocolate in my ear. Green and black. Yeah, so green and blacks isn't bad. Green and blacks is quite good. Um, are you allowed to bring food stuff into the US? I would be surprised if you are, actually. I don't know. Um, um, and many Contheran is, is online at the same time as me. Oh, well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, is there a specific required cocoa content? Yes, I think there are some rules on that. Uh, I'm not quite sure um, what they are. Um, but um, EU rules now for 5% vegetable oil and chocolate. Okay, so some of the stuff that we're familiar with. So Cadbury's and Galaxy. Who are Galaxy owned by? in the UK Roundtree, I don't know. Um, it, um, you know, it's way, it's, it's got too much vegetable oil in um, to, to, to count as chocolate. It's it's a chocolate flavored product, I think. <laughs> and Swiss chocolate, Swiss chocolate is awesome as well. So Swiss and Belgian chocolate, I would hold up as kind of being the top chocolates generally in the world. Um, so it looks like Topic uh, chocolate bar in the UK was similar to Snickers in the US. Uh, no, we have Snickers here. Um, and of course, there's a generation, my generation of people obviously regards Snickers as the wrong name. Um, it was called, it, when I was a young, when I were a lad, <laughs> when all this was fields, <laughs> um, I, um, it was called a marathon in the UK. And that's the, that's the name we grew up with it. No, that's not the same as a topic bar. Um, so the, no, the, no, the Snickers isn't quite the same as topic. I'm not quite sure what the difference is. Um, and so yes, yeah, so a marathon is what we call it in the UK. The proper title, as Jason says, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the proper British title for an American product. <laughs> and then it presumably, somewhere along the line, somebody decided um, to, you know, to harmonize the brand name and marathon was dropped. So we don't have marathons anymore. 
um, when, when all this was domes and church towers and analog clocks. That's right, like in a video. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so we don't have um, we don't have marathons anymore. We now have Snickers. Um, so and and I presume now a generation of kids in the UK has grown up without marathons, which is which is shocking. Yeah, that's just as wrong. <laughs> but so so Snickers no topic a topic. I, don't, I can't remember now what made a topic different. Uh, maybe it was just the hazelnuts. Uh, what have the Snickers got in them? Are they peanuts or are they something else nuts? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> that's got nothing to do with the topic of the day. Um, marathon is peanuts. Yeah, so it's peanuts versus hazelnuts. But it's probably a similar kind of thing. But I think I think topics were slightly nicer than marathons. At least I prefer I preferred them as as I recall. So anyway, there we go. <laughs> When I was a lad, yes, we would we would harvest the Snickers bars fresh from the ground. Um, that's, we would. That's right. Yeah. Everything. The problem. The problem back then, of course, everything was in black and white. It was a real shock one day when we all woke up and then it's like color. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you you kids nowadays, you, you know, the, the the day the day everything went from black and white to colour, that that was a day. That really was a day. It was amazing. And, and the only problem we had was that we used to walk a lot faster in the olden days, and then we had to slow down when colour was invented. It was it was it was it was very bad. So you know, we, we used to walk around really really quickly in the black and white days, and then nobody did after that. It was very strange. So <laughs> now, has anybody spotted my hat pin for tonight? Look, look I've got a new one. A bit overexposed. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. There we go. It's just about focused. We, <laughs> Jesus, we went we went through a sepia period. Oh yeah, the sepia period. Yes. Yeah. When we, when we were experimenting with what color things should be. That's right. <laughs> so my hat, my hat is boldly going, um, where no, <laughs> where no hat has gone before. Um, so it's, it's all, actually if I if I sort of go from over here, look, I could do the Star Trek intro sequence. Goodbye, Kate. You know, boldly go when it was for that. I sort of need to do a whoosh. whoosh. <laughs> I can do the Star Trek intro sequence. There we go. With William Shatner. Ah, uh, dear, there we go. Mind. <laughs> so, uh, anybody, anybody new to the stream will be wondering what that is going on tonight. It is an enterprising hat. <laughs> Very good. It's a bold. It's it's boldly, but definitely boldly go. Um, One division. <laughs> One division is surreal. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's sort of it's sort of um, that um, um, Wizard of Oz moment, isn't that? Was was that sepia toned and black and white at the beginning? Um, and then it went colour, didn't it? Um, that was a, that was a big deal when that first happened. It was it was like that. Okay. So anyway. <laughs> ah dear. Um, so anyway, so from chocolate and ice cream through to black and white sepia. What what is the topic of the day? We should we should talk about the topic of the day. Um, really. Now I thought um, we we sort of covered this one a little bit in the past. Commander O'Connor <laughs> Commander O'Connor says I am older than you, Drew. Color TV was not the scary thing. More than two channels. More than two channels. Yeah. Do you remember the days when we had the you know to change channel? You just sort of went click click, or sometimes even tuned it in. <laughs> Imagine doing that nowadays with like sixteen billion channels or whatever we have nowadays. Um, I remember I remember the TVs having. One of the earliest TVs I can remember had six settings. It was like BBC in the UK. We only had a few TV channels back in the seventies. So BBC One, BBC Two, which was the British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, uh, we had ITV, which was independent television, as I as I recall. <laughs> and then basically you just had the gap. There were there were three other settings to make the six dial. That basically were number four, five, and six because those television stations hadn't yet to be invented. <laughs> <laughs> so there were only three channels for a long, long time. I think cha did Channel Four in the UK was that was that in the early eighties? I'm just trying to remember now. Um, I remember it being a big thing that we had a fourth television channel. <laughs> it just seems ludicrous now, doesn't it? Um, but um, yeah, yeah, we had we had yeah, we, and we could put little yeah, you know, we put little sticky thing on the four, so Channel Four. 1984 was it? 1984. Blimey. I think I remember staying up or or being late for school, I think, as Channel 4 Lords. It was that historical in the UK. Um, or 1982, 1984, somewhere, anyway, somewhere early 80s, we got a fourth television channel. I mean, that was a, that, and it was a big deal. Um, <laughs> was, this was long before remote controls. Remote controls in those days, as um, uh, Glenn says, we were the remote control. 
Just change the telly over to Channel 4. Who okay. Um, I remember my grandparents having a remote control for the television that allowed you to change channels and oddly enough switch the television off but it didn't, it didn't allow you to switch the television back on again <laughs> so it had an off button but if you pressed it then you'd have to get up and switch the television on um, and I always <laughs> remember thinking that was a bit odd um, uh, my goodness only four channels yeah you had 12 12 channels I mean that's just insane how many how many channel how many TV channels could you possibly want um, uh, the first TV we had going to I think the first one that I remember you had to tune it manually it was like a radio dial so you would sort of just you know scroll it up and down trying to find the TV um, 2nd of November 1982 there we go Wowzers um, and we can go all the way back to silent films now too <laughs> Maybe I, maybe I should do that for one of my streams. It's just there's me talking, looking alarmed about something, and then the screen comes up with some text on it and some sort of honky tonk piano music in the background. <laughs> that might be quite fun. Um, manually tuning TV, I mean, in, in this day of digital broadcasting, it does seem rather quaint and very old fashioned, which of course it is. The eighties, the eighties are an uncomfortable. One of my friends, Stephen Usher, who's often on the Saturday stream, he realised that um, it is you know because you know because he and me and various people of my generation are now in our 50s yeah if only just it does mean that the year we were born was 1970 and that is as far away now as the 1920s were when we were born <laughs> it sounds awful but it's maths okay it's half a century isn't it um so oh dear, i don't know but um uh, that's a great idea <laughs> It's deeper. In the UK, we had the same channels on VHF and UHF, but in the US, uh, there was uh, VHF and UHF channels giving more. Oh, wow. Okay, so you could transmit different things. Um, so old school technology in the days. I kind of, I do kind of miss those days in some, some ways. <laughs> things were simpler, I think. Um, um, uh, at least, yeah, it, <laughs> maybe that's just me being a child enjoying those times. Uh, it's a bit strange, but uh, there we go. Never mind. Anyway, thank you for following AC931274. <laughs> that sounds like, um, oh, that's, that's, I don't know what that sounds like. Actually. It doesn't sound like anything. It's, it's, it's a difficult to remember username. But anyway, very welcome anyway. Lovely to see you. Um, aluminium foil and tennis. <laughs> and tennis, yes, that's right. Anyway, right, so topic of the day. Our topic of the day. Um, um, we have sort of discussed this before, but it's got a space weapons again, but with a focus on absolutely obliterating things, okay? So um, I'm, <laughs> I'm you know, looking at how you would completely obliterate a planet, okay, in science fiction. So we, uh, we can start off with um, 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 Things like, yeah, let's, let's start with Star Wars, because Star Wars is a nice, easy place. Everyone's heard of Star Wars, and everyone's heard of things like the Death Star, right? And that was the big, that was the big thrill of, of Star Wars, of course, from a kind of technological perspective. It's, oh, it's the Death Star, and it can blow up a planet. And we actually see it blow up a planet, even better. Um, and um, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so obviously the Death, yeah, for the, for the Death Star, you know, so let's blow up a planet. Um, now I always, even, I mean, how old, were, uh, you know, uh, let's take a quick poll on that. How old were you when you saw the original Star Wars? Now I was seven um, and I went to see it with my dad at the cinema. Um, uh, my mum says she would have taught me, but she, um, um, she would have taken me to see Star Wars, but she couldn't understand what the heck was going on. So my dad took me instead. And I do remember my dad who would have been, how old were you? He, would have, he was born in 42. So he would have been, he would have been in his thirties actually, which is quite weird. It would have been 30, it would be about 35, actually, thinking about it. Um, yeah, when he saw Star Wars, I remember him being, um, um, I remember him being, in, you know, really kind of bowled over by the special effects in Star Wars. I don't think he'd seen anything like it before. And he was, you know, he was into science fiction stuff in, in, in a reasonable way and I remember him being really impressed by Star Wars he was just he hadn't come out and seen anything anything else like it at all um, and um, anyway we you know, love the film but, you know, and, and, and there's this big scene when <laughs> of course the Death Star which is that's no moon it's um, um, a small a small moon a, presumably sort of asteroid sized I would say the Death Star really rather than being a moon um, and um, 
Uh, five years old when it was on TV. So yeah, so I was one of the lucky ones who got to see it at the cinema when it first came out, which which was quite good. I hadn't seen anything like it before. Um, and of course, the Death Star fires this like multi pronged beam laser thing, and then you know, Alderaan is destroyed. <laughs> now, um, um, I do remember my dad pointing out. He said, "He said no, laser beams don't do that, son." <laughs> <laughs> which was some relief to my seven-year-old self, actually. Um, he said, there's two things wrong with that. Um, he said, one, if you fire laser beams at each other, they don't sort of fuse into a point and then go off in a different direction. He said, it doesn't work like that. Um, they go through each other. So that, he said, that would look very pretty, but it wouldn't work very well. Um, so <laughs> I'm pleased to report my dad was picking holes in Star Wars immediately he came out of the cinema. <laughs> um, he said, well, that wouldn't work. He said, and, he said, and I do remember him saying, I'm not sure that's the right, if you're going to blow up a planet, he said, I'm not sure that's the right way to do it. I never, I must have, I should have pushed him on it exactly to why. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure he would have come across the line that basically that's an extremely inefficient way to blow up a planet. And it probably wouldn't blow up like that, um, even if you did hit it with a really, really, really big laser. So, um, so, <laughs> but I mean, Star Wars, Star Wars isn't known for its um, accuracy in terms of physics is it that you know so we, we have to give Star Wars I, I tend to class Star Wars as more fantasy than science fiction really although it's and that, you know that, that's a genre thing that you know, we, we, we do get hung up a bit on in, in science fiction circles fantasy circles is what actually is fantasy and what actually is science fiction um, if anything I think um, Star Wars is more fantasy than it is science fiction. And the, and the problem is people go, oh, it's set in space, so therefore it's science fiction. Said, well, mm, not really, no, because there's not a great deal of science going on in Star Wars. <laughs> I mean, for a start, you've got spaceships that fly in space. You know, that, that's that's wrong. Um, hyperspace, I mean, that's, yeah, that's kind of made up stuff but we have we have we, we can I, I'm, I'm okay with hyperspace because it's sort of a shortcut for a higher dimension which yeah maybe is possible um who knows um but then you've got magical space wizards of course <laughs> using the force that's impossible uh, as far as we to be know um so yeah so maybe space opera is the right word um it's a bit more it's sort of a blend isn't it it's like well we'll we'll, we'll ignore the laws of physics where it's you know it, it's good for drama and adventure um and, um, you know, uh, I, I did appreciate at the time poor Princess Leah watching her entire planet be destroyed. I thought, you know, that's that's really sad. <laughs> they get those bad guys. Um, but, um, you know, and, and the and the weapons on Star Wars, the, the la they're not, are they lasers? Because they don't really act like lasers, do they? They sort of do and they sort of don't. So um, you see, um, you see the Imperial and the Rebel cannons or what yeah, they look like cannons they have oddly enough they also have a recoil I don't know if you spotted that on the original Star Wars and some of the other later ones is when they're firing these beams of lasers or pulses of lasers or whatever they are um, they the cannons have a recoil it's like okay so are they lasers or are they something else um, or do they sort of are they are they sort of projectiles of some kind it's 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 not entirely clear how they work um, maybe somebody who's more versed in Star Wars lore can tell me um, but the the la what, what appear to be lasers, um, they, they they act more like sort of incendiary rounds of some sort of strange type, um, of different colours, and you can always tell the bad guys. The bad guys tend to have green weapons for some reason, and the good guys seem to have red weapons most of the time. Um, <laughs> NG is mass heads to recall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're slugs of plasma. Um, so anyway, so the, the the small ships tend to, and, the, and you know the the other ships tend to have guns, and the, the the laser beams or laser slugs or plasma bolts, whatever they are, don't move at the speed of light unless the speed of light is different in a galaxy far, far away, long, long time ago. Um, <laughs> whereas the Death Star laser does, it, it's sort of. It has a ring of lasers around the edge of the dish, which sort of focus to a point, which is kind of cool. Those sort of coalesce, don't they? And then the beam is emitted, <laughs> which then strikes the planet, and the planet instantly explodes into a billion pieces. Um, so that's that's interesting. Now, even if even if you had that much energy, uh, you know, to disassociate a planet, and you pump that into a planet, what you'd get is a very to start with, I thought would be a very very hot planet. Um, and you know, you see it expand outwards at this incredible speed as it kind of explodes, like it's only about this big. 
<laughs> presumably it's the special effects that they were working with at the time. Um, there's no, even if you could blow up a planet like that, there's no way it would expand outwards in a massive explosion of disintegrating pieces. Um, in that, you just you can't accelerate that fast. That that's impossible. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's that doesn't seem to me a very realistic way of killing a planet, um, and they sort of they they sort of um, so what was the point of the dish on the depths? I'm not sure. I mean, presumably it was a sort of. I always assumed it was a sort of focal generator for the special laser beams that made the killer the killer weapon, but because uh, they they come out of that point, don't? And we see it do that on Return of the Jedi because it, it destroys bits of the Rebel fleet um, with this you know the massive massive beam laser. Um, bit of TV reception. That's what the dish is for. It was actually a very early Sky dish. That's what it was for. For picking up, picking up, um, you know, Sky television. <laughs> um, so um, you know, it's it's an obvious example, but it's not a good one. That's I don't think it's an entire it, you know at all plausible way of destroying a planet is using a Death Star. And you know, we can we never saw the second Death Star try and destroy a planet. It never got finished before the rebels blew it up. And that makes <laughs> that one makes me laugh as well because you've got the original Death Star, okay? Which you know it's the first one, it's a prototype. You know you're not necessarily you're going to have a few design flaws along the way. I think we can we can get the original Death Star that, and it's got an exhaust port, okay? Yeah, which if you're a magic space wizard and you can fire a missile into a shaft at right angles at speed, <laughs> which I never quite understood why it was like that. Um, because the when Luke when Luke fires and you know, use the force, Luke, all that sort of stuff, he has to fire the torpedoes in the trench, and then they as they get to the the, the exhaust port, they, they sort of do a ninety degree turn, don't they? And it's like, hmm? <laughs> and then presumably the torpedoes go all the way down that tube to the central reactor, and then they hit the reactor, and boom, and the thing the thing explodes. So it's the the, the 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 small thermal exhaust port right below the main port, as as it's described in the attack. Um, we don't know what the main port was, and the same as for one one breath. I think it was an intake, not an exhaust. I'm sure they called it an exhaust port, though, didn't they call it an exhaust port? Um, elite dangerous missile physics. Yes, that's exactly what it is. So maybe the world, maybe physics is different uh, in a galaxy far, far away and a long time ago. Who knows? But um, so that always struck me as a bit odd. The other thing I never understood with Star Wars, and I still nobody's come up with a rational explanation that I'm aware of, is why fly down the trench at all? It's like, let's choose the hardest way to attack this exhaust port. Uh, let's fly our ships down kilometers of trench where we can't maneuver, where the enemy ships can sneak in behind us and blast us. <laughs> Why don't we just fly along the surface like we were doing in the early part of the attack? Um, and then if given that exhaust port is a hole that we want to fire directly down to and we don't want to do it at right angles because you know, that's, that's really difficult, right? Why don't we just fly straight at it from orbit? And just shoot all of our ships. Everybody just fire your proton torpedoes directly at that hole in the ship without all this mucky about with the trench. And we'd have, we'd have killed the Death Star easily. Why do you have to fly down the trench? Anyway, I know, I know it's a homage to Dan Busters. I know it's a homage to Dan Busters. Because this is the way. <laughs> Very good. Uh, it is the, this is the way. This is the way. Um, so. Yeah, so that, that yeah, um, not, <laughs> and then the odd thing was, okay, so the Death Star, the original Death Star did have that design flaw of the exhaust port where if you did get a lucky one in a million shot kid, um, then you had a chance of destroying the, you know, the Death Star. So when we build the second Death Star, okay, we're going to, we're going to consider that carefully, right? Okay, so how do the first Death Stars get destroyed? Well, the magic space wizard shot a missile at right angles down a really narrow exhaust port. Tell you what, we'll, we'll, we won't build the second Death Star with that kind of design flaw, okay? We'll put some kinks in the exhaust port so a missile's got no chance <laughs> unless it can turn multiple right angles on the way down. Um, which might be possible for a magical space wizard, but you know, let's make it as difficult as possible. Or maybe we can make exhaust ports even smaller and have more of them. That would be that would be my suggestion for the architects of the second Death Star. But no, but no. Amazingly, the architects of the second Death Star thought, tell you what, <laughs> let's make the exhaust ports so big you can fly a spaceship down them. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> There's no way the rebels will figure out how to attack that. <laughs> so I was going to like, and even Star Killer Base. Um, let's put a really um, simple exposed heat heat 
heat, heat exchanger, I think it was, or something, wasn't it? Um, that if that gets blown up, the whole thing will overheat really, really quickly, and boom, it goes bang. So I'm, I'm not, yeah, this entire planet-killing weapon thing um, that we have in the Star Wars, you're not convinced it's a good idea. It seems to be an awful lot of infrastructure build uh, for not to make very much effectiveness. I don't know how much it would cost to build a Death Star. Um, but your payback in terms of planets destroyed versus installations built and amount of money spent doesn't seem to me to be a very good ratio. <laughs> um, and the metal, yeah, Gorfix Starship was quite right. There we go. A metal grate would ruin the Jedi's plan. That's, that's all you need is a mesh across the. <laughs> so uh, that's big government. I think you're probably right. Yeah, it's like we're gonna we're gonna build this because we said we were gonna build it. Um, or commission it before it's even finished. So you can yeah, so that's uh, so, right. Yeah, so um, we we switched this fully operational battle station. Well, you, there's half of the bottom bit of it's missing, uh, Mister Mister Evil um, Jedi, uh, not, uh, Sith dude. <laughs> so there we go. Needs bigger ports. I have I have spoken. <laughs> that's right. Um, I have to muster. I completely rate the Mandalorian way above the Star Trek films. Now I'm very impressed with the Mandalorian. I thought it was really good. Um, so even even the, uh, even the guys in the in the script for the later films weren't taking it seriously. It's, it's like Starkiller Base. It's like it's well, so here's the original Death Star. Here's the second Death Star. This is Starkiller Base. Oh, it's a bigger Death Star. Okay, <laughs> we know what we got to do. Um, so so anyway, so if we're going to kill a planet, I think a Death Star is overkill. Okay, is much much easier ways to kill a planet. So going to the opposite extreme, um, you may not be aware of this actually because it's. Um, in one of the later novels, but Arthur C. Clarke tried to destroy the Earth, um, and um, yeah, he's not he's not one he's not a science fiction writer who's generally known for um, you know blowing up planets, but he actually he did actually uh, attempt to destroy the Earth. Um, the 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 um, uh, antagonists in there were actually foiled by the. Uh, the elegance and cleverness of humanity, but um, he did he did attempt to destroy the Earth as well. Um, I have seen the Mandalorian. Yes, I have seen the the Mandalorian. All of all of its episodes. So yes. Uh, you, so if 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 you're okay on the stream to discuss Mandalorian plot uh, and spoiler free, then that's good. So I'm good. I'm good. I don't know if anybody else on the stream is, but I'm good. <laughs> um, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Arthur C. Clarke, he, um, you know, um, so in the sequence of films, um, uh, well, books really, because there are only two films, uh, 2001 and 2010, um, humanity encounters an, uh, an incredibly advanced alien culture, which reportedly at the end of the second book and kind of into the third, um, is evaluating humanity's potential against, you know, some criteria, and actually decides, no, humanity is not good enough, we're going to wipe them out. Um, so in in the book 2061 Odyssey 3 I think it is um, or is it 3001 or something I can't remember which one it is one of the, one of the later ones right at the end um, um, Arthur C. Clarke aliens who you never see they only appear by proxy in the form of a gigantic um, it looks a bit like a chocolate bar oddly enough <laughs> <laughs> a really dark dark chocolate bar basically a rectangular slab that's just a sort of ebony rectangular slab that floats around in space and has this sort of weird um, chorus effect around it whenever you go close to it. Um, and it's it's quite spooky and quite intimidating, but basically the aliens are represented by this monolith. It's called a monolith. It's just a black, huge, quite big, enormous black slab that floats around in space, being menacing. Um, it, in, in, in 2010, it, it splits itself into multiple parts and keeps on doing that and is able to turn Jupiter into a small star. And in one of the later books, it turns up in Earth orbit, replicates itself into a great big flat paddle and basically eclipses the Earth from the sun. So there is no daylight uh, reaching the Earth. And as a result of that, obviously, um, you know, the long term impact of that would be that Earth would freeze solid and, and we would all die. So that's that's how Arthur C. Clarke attempted to destroy the Earth. So that I thought was a relatively elegant way of of obliterating humanity. <laughs> of course, that wouldn't destroy the planet. It would only just destroy what was on the planet. It was a way of purging life on the planet rather than destroying the planet. So there is a distinction between do we do we mean um, obliterating the Earth in terms of its viability to support life? Or do we actually mean destroying the planet entirely? So, so there we go. <laughs> those are those are those are two extremes. 
Um, uh, I haven't seen The Mandalorian yet, says Chris. So, um, so got it partly spoiled. Some kind of oh, I haven't. I hope I haven't given any spoilers on the stream. I uh, just like The Mandalorian. I thought it was really, really good. Um, so there are a few people who haven't spe seen The Mandalorian. Go, go watch it. You better hurry up because the the, the chances of um, well, the chances of anything coming from Mars. Well, we know that's a million to one. The chances of being spoiler free on The Mandalorian for much longer are going to be very difficult. <laughs> So many people have watched it. Um, so, um, uh, so <laughs> Marvin the Martian tried to use the Illumium PU-36 explosive space modulator to blow up the Earth. Well, that, that might work. <laughs> um, the enemy you can't see and learn scares you more than the one you can. Yeah, so actually, uh, the, the, the aliens in 2001 were, you never saw them. They were just sort of, you know, so advanced. They were kind of beyond. Yeah, they were, they were meta aliens almost, uh, but um, yeah, they they decided that humanity needed to be extinguished, and that's the way they went about it. And that's actually a much more constructive way because if you cut off a planet's um, um, you know heat and light, then and anything living on it will die fairly fast. Um, so you know that's 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 a it's not, it's not a very dramatic way to kill everybody. <laughs> It doesn't happen like that, but give it a few weeks, everybody will be dead. So, um, <laughs> who got poetry? Yes, that's prob that's probably one of the cruelest ways to extinguish life, because <laughs> you all go mad. And I think you know the the, the normal reaction to Vogon poetry is 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 your your middle intestine leaps up through your neck and the throttles your brain or something. <laughs> that's like a pretty nasty way to go. Um, so so that's <laughs> that's a way to get everyone to commit suicide. Um, Dumpeel, yes. Yeah. So Jupiter was ignited to start because the monolith replicated so much, adding several Jupiter masses. Um, uh, we're not quite sure how they did it, but it's quite a nice piece of science fiction that the, basically the monoliths increased the mass of Jupiter and thus turned it into a star. Um, so, um, so that's um, so that's 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 a way to do, you know to do things. Um, an easy way to. Um, you know, there's, there's other ways to destroy. It. I mean, we're doing quite a good job of destroying the ecosystem ourselves, actually. <laughs> Whether <laughs> without wanting to get too political, um, you know, if we, <laughs> if you do accept, as I do, that you know, climate change and global warming are a thing that we humans are doing, um, then <laughs> if we're doing a pretty good job of wiping stuff out at the moment um, in terms of you know, biodiversity and all that kind of good stuff. So you know, maybe we will obliterate ourselves. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, that, that's a way to kill all life on the planet, uh, just adding lots and lots of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, uh, which worked very, very well on Venus, as, we, as we've seen. So there, there's a thing. OK, so that's that's a way to destroy the planet. Um, you could. There's quite a few ways that the planet can be zapped from space, actually. So if um, you know, we, we detected one actually just last week, I think, is um, we had the, you know, uh, a gamma ray burst. Um, now most of these are so far away that they're not not an issue. Um, they are they're, they're absolutely incredible, incredible outpourings of energy. I mean they're just you know stonking the off the scale in terms of a stellar event. You know they're probably the biggest bangs since the actual Big Bang, um, other than Zayfall Zayfall Beetle Rocks of course. Um, and um, you know if one of those went off anywhere close by. Um, i.e. in our galaxy, and it was vaguely pointing in our direction, that would be very, very bad news because it would obliterate the um, the ozone layer um, and probably do all sorts of nasty harm to um, the atmosphere in general. Anybody who was exposed to it um, on the surface of the time would be a, would, would basically be dead from catastrophic DNA damage. Um, and so if, basically everything on one side of the planet uh, would be irradiated really, really badly. Uh, the, you know, the rest of us, if we were on the dark side of the Earth, away from the gamma ray burst, um, would probably have an awful lot of problems really, really quickly <laughs> as a result. Um, and so a gamma ray burst is a, is a pretty good way to sterilize a planet. So we wouldn't want one of those going off okay, close by. The planet itself physically would be unharmed. But any life on the surface, a gamma ray burst would be a very, very effective way of getting rid of it uh, quite quickly. So. Um, you know, that's, that's maybe something we've got to look forward to in 2021. <laughs> um, so that would be really bad. Um, uh, slightly bars would we'll know how to destroy a planet or just, but well, I suppose you could, but slightly bars would we'll probably know how to dismantle a planet. So, um, um, <laughs> because you'd have the original blueprints, wouldn't you? Um, so that's, so that's, that's the thing. So, you know, gamma ray burst, um, that, that's quite a good way. Supernova, you'd have to have a supernova pretty close to the Earth to cause any significant damage to either the planet or the atmosphere. So supernova, um, 
you'd have to have one probably 10, 15, 20 light years away. Um, and there aren't any of those likely to go off. So, so that's, that. <laughs> sorry, Chris. <laughs> so yeah, so the chances of a gamma ray burst or a supernova are, are vanishingly small. I don't think you need to actually concern yourself with those. Um, so, so <laughs> thank you, Yankee Events, for the follow. I'm, I'm missing the follow. Sorry. So, um, um, thank you for thank you for the follow. It's always appreciated. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. the cheery topic of how to obliterate the planet. So, most of these, you know, getting rid of life on a planet, or at least at least advanced life, because, um, or you know, we, <laughs> well, us humanity likes to think of ourselves as advanced life. Of course, um, it depends what you mean by advanced, really, <laughs> or intelligent. Um, uh, you know, as I've gotten older. Um, you know, you know the, the concept of intelligent life. <laughs> I look around at the world we have made, and I'm not convinced intelligent is quite the right word. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but um, intelligence is perhaps not the right word. <laughs> Would a gamma ray burst reach the vaults on the mountain? So actually, Scan, um, Scavan, Scavandari uh, makes a good point. Actually, is that gamma radiation is, is yeah, will penetrate quite a lot. But um, you know, it certainly wouldn't be able to get through kilometres of rock, um, so you're okay there. So you could, if you if you could see it coming, which unfortunately you can't, but if you could, um, you could hide from a gamma ray burst if you had the right place to go. The problem was is everything on the surface would 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 be in trouble um, pretty quickly, and the the surface of the planet would be uninhabitable within a few weeks because everything would be dying. Um, and with the ozone layer gone, there'd be an awful lot of radiation coming down from the sun, which would be very harmful as well as a result afterwards. So um, it would be a pretty miserable existence if you did survive, a bit like a sort of nuclear winter, really, but with, with, with lots of sunshine. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so um, barely sentient, says Chase. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so the atmosphere would, would the, you know, the lack of ozone in particular would be a, would be a problem. Um, and the atmosphere um, would, 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 yeah. So it wouldn't be a nice place to have survived. I think you'd have a fairly long lingering death as a result. Um, what have we had a large hadron collider? So <laughs> this one comes up every so often. Is uh, and there's a I don't know. Have you seen this? Let me <laughs> let me do this because this is quite funny. Um, at least it was working last time I checked. And it, this is very important. This is a very very uh, important scientific website. Okay. Um, so uh, where's my where's my screen um, screen capture? Um, yeah, not that one. There we go. No, not that one. Uh, oh, I've lost my thing. Um, hang on, I'm gonna have to set up a new one. Let me bear with me a moment. I'll I'll be back. Uh, <laughs> uh, window capture. No, what do I want? I want display capture. There we go. Just just. Here we are. There's, okay, so there's there's okay. You can't see me, but look, there's a website here called Has the Large Hadron Collider Destroyed the World Yet? dot com. Okay, now this is an important website. If you go there, it says no, or oh, nope. <laughs> so that's an important website. Okay, so if you ever need to know whether the Large Hadron Collider has in fact destroyed the Earth. You can just go to that website, has the large hadron collider destroyed the destroy the world yet dot com and you will get a, a definitive answer as to whether or not we're still safe. All right. <laughs> so there you go. I hope I have reassured you. At least you can check, okay? At least you can check. <laughs> that website is exactly my sense of humour, so I'm glad it's a very important website. Um, I did send them an email once. I said it's it's a jolly, I said this is an excellent website and I, I fully support the fact that you've got this website up and running. Um, I said, however, in the event that the Large Hadron Collider does in fact destroy the Earth, I said, have you got a backup web server somewhere <laughs> which you can then update with? Yep. <laughs> and I got the answer back from them saying, yes, there's a backup web server on the far side of the moon. Which will be activated uh, following our disaster recovery plan should the Earth actually be destroyed. <laughs> so we're covered. Okay, so covered. So if you go to that website and it says "yup," uh, then you're you're getting redirected to the moon-based web server, 
um, quite where you will be at that point in time, I'm not entirely sure, but if, if you are able to access the website in the event that the world has been destroyed and you are able to confirm it says, yep, then uh, <laughs> presumably you're using lunar Wi-Fi or something. <laughs> It could be hosted on Mars. It could be Elon Musk. I mean, who knows, right? Um, so that's quite good. So, um, so there you go. So that's 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 another way. So most of the most plausible ways to destroy the Earth or a planet focus on actually eradicating life from the surface. Now, and it's ironic, actually, going back to Star Wars for a moment. Um, with Star Killer Base, it sort of drained the power of the star, the local star, um, in order to use that energy to zap the planets or destroy the planets. Um, and in fact, if you had enough energy to destroy the star itself, or you could siphon off the star's energy and stop it from shining, that would be a perfectly effective way of um, of, of, dis <laughs> of obliterating the planets. Because without their star, um, as, you know, even assuming you didn't get rid of the mass, um, you left the mass there, so the planets would keep going around. Without without their star, without heat and light, the planets are going to freeze really quickly. <laughs> that that will tend to wipe out life fairly fast. Um, so that that you know, it was definitely overkill, not only to drain the star, but also then to zap the planet. Um, that's really the empire, or the first order, whatever they're called in the, the later mills, just just being really, really, really efficient and leaving no stone unturned in order to obliterate things. Um, you know, uh, you know, um, and Glenn, actually, opportunity coming up for you to plug our nine streams of consciousness book because in that we hypothesized the. Um, destruction of the earth not by um, not by actually hitting it with anything but simply by having a rogue um, um, what was it was it a planet I can't remember now <laughs> Was it, it was a was it, it was a brown dwarf wasn't it that's right a brown dwarf star sweeping into the solar system and disrupting the orbit of the planets in such a way that our um, uh, the earth was cast into a much more elliptical orbit than it you know, currently is in, and the issue there is, of course, as the um, as the uh, as the orbit is made more elliptical, the Earth recedes so far from the Sun that it effectively freezes, almost freezes solid uh, at one point in its orbit, and gets roasted at the other end. That that will extinguish life quite quickly as well. And if you, if your elliptical orbit is elliptical enough, your planet will actually get chucked out of the solar system entirely. And if the Earth was put on an orbit which took it way outside the solar system on an ellipse. Um, the Earth would freeze solid at a kind of uh, water, you know, all the water on Earth would freeze solid by the time we got to, um, you know, be just beyond the orbit of Mars. And then when we get beyond about the orbit of Saturn, all of the, uh, you know, all of the oxygen and the nitrogen in the atmosphere freezes solid as well. So, you know, we'd have, we'd have all sorts of interesting things to look forward to. It would definitely snow. We'd definitely have quite a lot of snow. <laughs> Um, and so that's that's quite a good way to kill a planet. Just alter its orbit a little bit. You know, if you can push it a bit further away from its star, then that that will freeze it. You know, quite dramatically as well. Um, so you know, there there are quite a few ways to you know to render a planet totally and utterly uninhabitable. You can either heat it up, or you can uh, subject it to lethal radiation, uh, or you can you know you can engineer a way to make it freeze such that um, anything living on it is is destroyed. Um, so you know, with those cheery thoughts, <laughs> that's right. So um, atmosphere about twenty centimeters thick. So if you if you froze all of the oxygen and nitrogen, you'd have a, a layer of stuff on top of the ice, the water ice, be about be about that high, which would be oxygen and nitrogen ice. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so we could get we could get rid of the moon if you've got a moon. So removing the moon from the Earth would destabilize the Earth over a long period of time, and there wouldn't be um, there wouldn't be any tides anymore. Uh, that would definitely affect the stability of the, uh, the the axle tilt of the Earth. That would wander all over the place. That could be quite alarming. Uh, so that was that was good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you could you could potentially alter the orbit of the Earth by slinging asteroids nearby. I mean, if you had lots and lots of time and lots and lots of patience, you could you could potentially um, you know, alter the orbit of the Earth by chucking asteroids out. They don't even have to actually hit it; they just need to go close, and that would slowly alter the orbit of the Earth. So that that could be quite good. Um, Space nineteen ninety nine, of course, yes, where we eject the moon. <laughs> Those poor people back in space ninety nine. <laughs> The funny thing is, space 1999 is now 20, uh, 22 years ago. <laughs> those those poor people on the moon, we remember them. It's coming up to their 25th anniversary. 
I remember watching that as a kid thinking, wow, 1999, that's so far in the future. Um, and now it's 20, 22 years in the past. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so th that's another way of destroying the earth. Um, a few people managed to hang on to Alan's, Alan's story in um, uh, Nine Streams of Consciousness, which is the collaborative book we all wrote on this very Twitch stream. Um, you know, you know, there are a few survivors from that instant, um, but the earth is, is irrevocably changed as a result. Um, <laughs> the science is based on that. Yeah, to be honest, the science in a lot of those shows is pretty bad, but. Um, um, yeah, uh, Space 1999 was was fun. The special effects were good. I always thought, um, but um, yeah, the science science perhaps not so. It got a bit got a bit metaphysical, I think, uh, which is possibly the needs of episodic storytelling rather than anything else. But because um, you yeah, know the moon traveling through space, I mean, it wasn't moving at a particularly high speed, so um, it would have just been right. We've left the Earth, and um, well, nothing happens for months because <laughs> we're not moving very fast. Um, and I think they ended up falling through black holes and spatial anomalies and all sorts of weird stuff. But, um, you know, science fiction, storytelling, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I <laughs> so started reading the Martian Chronicles and that starts in 20... All this sci-fi stuff set in the far distant future is just about to happen. That's what's quite alarming. Um, uh, actually chucking a rock. OK, so let's go back to chucking a rock at the Earth. So we know about this from, from the dinosaurs, of course is um sorry i've got a really itchy nose tonight <laughs> what's going on <laughs> apologies for that um um oh there's a raid going on what's happened who's ugh, who's raiding me it's mad dog hello mad dog how are you uh <laughs> good to see you my friend good to see you um so thank you very much and and if you're a mad a mad doggist is that is <laughs> well my followers on here are sort of loosely called the druids so i don't know what a mad what, what <laughs> I don't know what the dogs are called. Is it just Unleash the Dogs of War or something? But anyway. Oh, and Ferret Tube. Oh, there we go. Ferret Tube. Oh, is that Kate Russell? Hello, Kate. How are you? Lovely to see you. Yay. This is my hat. Yes, I always wear a hat nowadays because um, it's, it's, it's just part of the tradition. But there we are. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, Commander Elysium. This is a, this is a family friendly stream, so you're going to have to be on your best, best behavior. <laughs> Um, he's thinking, I've, I have thinned much. I have thinned much, Mad Dog, I, I assure you. It's, <laughs> I just like wearing hats. I think it's, I think, I've, yeah, we need to have a hat renaissance. I think this is very important. Yeah. So, uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, so anyway, so chucking rocks, uh, chucking rocks at planets is, there, is, a, is, is an exceptionally good way to kill things on the surface because it's quite cheap. Okay. Quite cheap. Um, you know, you just basically just need to find yourself some average asteroid uh, and chuck it or deflect its orbit a bit until it intersects with a planet. Now that's, you know, that's a bit complicated. It's going to need a little bit of maths, a few slide rules probably. Um, maybe some, maybe maybe Bruce Willis or not, depending on whether you're what you're trying to do. But yeah, you could probably get a rock to collide with the Earth without too much difficulty. It's probably a relatively cheap way, particularly if you're a spacefaring civilization um, and you've got some rocket ships and stuff. You know, with fusion drives and, and, and things is actually, actually finding yourself an asteroid and just launching that at your enemies if they're on another planet is probably is is probably quite a cheap way of you know of causing massive um um massive um you know massive massive planetary devastation i think i think that's probably a, the, probably the cheapest way to do it to be honest <laughs> you know looking at it from an economic perspective how much money do we all want to spend obliterating this planet well we to be honest we don't we don't we don't want to spend too much money doing it um you now we want to um we <laughs> we want to um um, you know, we want to want the cheap, okay? So, yeah, you know, you know, what's the cheapest way of obliterating the Earth? Uh, well, probably chucking a rock at it, sir. Let's let's chuck a rock. So anyway, so we chuck a rock, um, and as you saw, uh, well, not as you saw, because <laughs> none of you were around then, um, except possibly me and Alan, I suspect. Yeah, uh, sixty-five million years ago is quite a long time, um, and um, you know, an asteroid comes down, makes a real big mess, okay? Makes a real big mess of the ground. Um, so um, uh, if, if an asteroid of any decent size hits a planet, um, it does make a big hole. It chucks loads and loads and loads of superheated rock and plasma into the atmosphere, which comes down again um, extremely hot. 
Um, now, the nice thing, if you happen to be anywhere close to ground zero when an asteroid hits the planet, um, you don't have to worry. Um, and the reason you don't have to worry is because you haven't got enough time to actually worry, because the impact blast will uh, completely um, obliterate you before your nervous system has any time to react. So there's a comforting thought, OK? Uh, <laughs> if you see the asteroid come down, um, you probably wouldn't see it, actually, because it would be so bright. It would be a lot, lot brighter than the sun, so you would be blind. Um, the, the, um, the sound would be so loud that you would be deafened. And then by the time you had the conscious thought about whether or not, oh, hello, mate, I can't see and I can't hear, um, that by the time your brain has had even the merest possibility of registering those thoughts, you would have ceased to exist. So um, an asteroid impact would be a very, very fast way of not having to worry about the problem anymore. Um, so, um, you, know, you know, when you see them crash in films like Deep Impact and Armageddon, that sort of thing, you see this you know, bright things streaming across the sky. That's not what that's not what they look like. Uh, they only look like that if they're really small. If they're big, um, you know, 100 kilometers of atmosphere, um, <laughs> it's like they'll be in that for like, and they're traveling at, I don't know, 46,000 miles an hour. You know, they're traveling at orbital speeds, okay? Um, and they hit the Earth at 100 kilometers at 46,000 miles now. He says he's, he's uh, mixing metric and imperial unit. Apologies for that. Um, yeah, 100 kilometers, that, that's, you know, 100, let's, say, let's stick with 100 miles. 100 miles at 46,000 miles an hour doesn't take very long, all right? You don't get a leisurely, oh, look, there's a massive plume of smoke across the sky. I wonder what this means. Um, no, you don't get any of that. You just, boom. <laughs> OK, the shock wave of, of disintegrating um, planet and the asteroid, it hits you at thousands of yeah, hundreds of times the speed of sound. You would not have chance to react before you cease to exist. So if you do get hit by an asteroid, you don't need to worry about it. OK, and the reason you don't need to worry about it is you don't have time. <laughs> um, the worst scenario actually is more the fact that um, if you're on the opposite side of the planet or somewhere quite a long way away from the impact point, um, the, you know, the superheated wall of plasma uh, is going to be heading towards you at about two, three thousand miles an hour. OK, so it's not going to be hanging around. Um, and um, it will in it will envelope the entire planet. So if you get a rock big enough, um, then the entire planet will be hit by the shock wave. And, um, you know, eventually will be sterilized. You won't <laughs> uh, you'll have a little bit longer. You'll have a, you know, you'll have a, you know, maybe half an hour or so. Um, and then, then that's it. Um, so if you get a sufficiently big rock, then, then, there's, then there's bad news for everybody involved because um, not only is the big rock come down and made the shock wave, then all the stuff it's chucked up into space is also on a parabolic orbit, which will then fall back down on the ground as well. And you'll get multiple sort of secondary uh, effects. So asteroid hitting the Earth, good way to obliterate and sterilize the planet. OK, so that, that's quite good. Um, <laughs> plasma, bring it, need a new TV. Um, so man versus pixels. So yes, so um, definitely a case of um, the best place to be is at the impact point or close by. So um, yeah. the only thing, of course, would be a bit scary, I think, actually, is if we knew the thing, whatever it was, was on an impact course with the Earth um, and um, there wasn't anything we could do about it. So if we had an object, let's say the size of a major asteroid, say something like Pallas or Ceres or something like that on an impact trajectory with the Earth. We'd know about it, or at least we should know about it, several several months in advance, and you'd be able to see it kind of looming in the sky. That would be that would be a bit scary. But if it kind of came out of the blue, well, it came out of the black, really. <laughs> Although if it did, well, I mean, it could come out of the blue. It depends on what planet side of the planet you're on at the time. Um, it would, you know, it, it would just take us completely unawares. Um, we don't, um, contrary to good science fiction films. We don't have a very comprehensive space scanning capability, OK? Um, now, in fact, we've lost a bit of it. You know, the Arecibo radio telescope used to do radar scans of things like that. Um, and of course, it's, it's busted now, so we can't use that. Um, we don't actually have a very good asteroid detection capability. Um, they keep coming past us and we go, oh, look, look, there, there was one of those asteroids. Um, so um, we don't we don't actually have that operating very well at the moment. So, so that's <laughs> there's another reassuring thought for you. Um, so that's that's quite a, that's that's quite, that's quite a good way of, of sterilizing the planet. OK, um, so we, well, we've covered gamma ray bursts. That That's not good. Supernovas are sort of in the same category, um, you know, Humanity doing it to ourselves with lots of g g greenhouse gases and that stuff. That's 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 sort of a slow lingering death, which is 
<laughs> we seem to be doing at the moment. Asteroid is pretty quick, to be honest. Uh, removing the moon, um, that would destabilize the planet over a long period of time. Um, we'd be okay for a few centuries, and then the, the Earth's axial tilt would wobble, which would cause some interesting atmospheric conditions, because under certain conditions, the pole of the Earth would be pointing directly at the sun, and then sometimes the other way around, and it would it would all get very, very confusing. So that, that might be quite stressful. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, a pallet size of it would be a bit over the top. So that would destroy, and we wouldn't need something that big. I mean, you don't need something like a, a size of a, a, you know, a, a decent sized mountain to finish off humanity. So, um, so um, and there are a few of those floating about, so <laughs> don't rule it out. Um, so, um, so there's, there's, there's quite a few things. Um, and, um, so you know, so there, you know, there's 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 potential ways of doing that. But actually, if you wanted to do complete destruction of the planet on the cheap, an asteroid impact is actually possibly one of the better ways to doing it. Um, so um, <laughs> so any of you budding entrepreneurs out there going, uh, okay, dastardly evil plot, asteroid, <laughs> that's the way to do it. So that, that's definitely one. That's definitely one. Um, but other ways we could destroy the planet. If you actually, the thing is, if you actually want to destroy the planet, and this is the one thing that does wind me up a little bit, actually, um, you know, about the, um, um, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't, you know, on a, on a semi-serious note for my stream, and I do appreciate it's a semi-serious note, um, you know, this, this you know, I, I, I'm, I am totally convinced that humanity is responsible for climate change and global warming. So I'm not, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to take that, yeah, anything away from that, because I think that's a serious problem that we do have to, we do have to deal with. But when we say we're destroying the planet, we're not, okay, we're not destroying the planet. All we're doing is we're upsetting the ecosystem rather dramatically, and that's not good for large creatures like us and most of the other large creatures of which we share the planet with. Okay, so um, climate change and global warming uh, will badly affect us as human beings, and it will badly affect large creatures. Um, but all the small stuff on the Earth isn't going to be bothered at all by it. You know, they'll, they'll continue to thrive, no problem at all. The future belongs, you know, to the ants and the termites and all the bacteria and all those sort of things. They're, they're going to be absolutely fine. They're, they're not going to have a problem with it whatsoever. Um, and as far as the actual Earth is concerned, it's an irrelevance because the Earth will simply, over a course of a few thousand years or a few million years, will simply balance it out and deal with it. Um, we may be long gone, unfortunately, by that point, depending on whether we get to grips with this or not. But we're not going to destroy the planet, okay? <laughs> that, that's not what it's going to do. That, that does annoy me when people say, we're destroying the planet. No, we're not, okay? <laughs> the planet will be fine. Uh, the creatures that live on it, less so. Uh, we certainly will be, will be affecting that. Um, so, um, um, <laughs> so, 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 you yeah, know, but yeah, we're certainly affecting it for creatures like us. That that is going to be a problem, I think. Um, and then there's another organism on the planet that follows the same problem. Do you know what is it? A virus? Well, yes, yeah, viruses. Viruses are curious little things, actually. And we know we know we know a bit more about viruses now. We're more, more familiar with COVID, of course. Um, viruses are almost not alive at all because without a host creature to live in, they can't they can't do anything. Um, viruses are a curious anomaly on the tree of life because, in many ways, they're not actually alive, and they they only able to do stuff when they invade a host cell of a creature that's more complicated than they are. So they're, they're peculiar things, viruses. Um, so, um, you know, so that's, that's a bit weird. <laughs> um, and, um, but you know, anything, anything small is going to be, I mean, tardigrade, there we go, tardigrades. Tardigrades are definitely one of the favorites. Um, Gorfic star shadows talk about, I mean, tardigrade, they'll, they'll survive anything. I mean, you can put them in gamma rays, you can put them in space. You, know, you can put them in a vacuum. Um, yeah, they'll just go to sleep for a bit, and then when the conditions are nice again, then they'll wake up and go about what they were doing. Um, so you know, um, extinguishing higher order creatures, and so, or if you let's say big, you know, well, you know rather than higher order, that maybe that's maybe that's a bit self-grandizing, but you know, big complex multicellular creatures like us, it's quite easy to wipe us out relatively. Um, if you want to wipe out the small stuff, you're going to have to try a bit harder. <laughs> and if you actually, actually want to destroy the planet, then you're going to have to work really, 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 really hard. You're going to need something much, much, much more powerful to, you know, to destroy a planet. If you're talking about collision, you need another planet. <laughs> so if you are able somehow to get Venus and the Earth to 
to crunch into each other. That would effectively destroy both planets. But what would eventually happen, of course, is the debris would simply, under gravity, coalesce back into another planet. So have you destroyed a planet there? Kind of. Um, if you... <laughs> If you actually want to get rid of all the matter that makes up a planet, then then that's that's really rather difficult. Um, the only way to do that would be to give all the components of the Earth enough um, velocity to it, to um, to basically break its own gravitational pull and then disperse into place. Now that would be a lot of energy. Okay, um, you, you need you need enough solar energy. I mean, there's enough power in the sun to do that, but. Um, there's nothing else really that can do it <laughs> that we we even could conceivably have access to. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, <laughs> and prions are even with yes. There, there is some weird stuff in in biology, isn't there? Um, so, um, hire a Death Star. <laughs> Death Stars for hire. <laughs> have you got a planet <laughs> that you want to get rid of, and nobody else can help? You've got the, you know a stubborn, stainy planet that you really want to remove. Then hire a Death Star. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so in order to actually completely obliterate a planet, you would have to overcome that planet's own gravitational field for all of the components of the planet, which means you have to accelerate all of the mass of the planet in a sort of spherical expanding direction away from the centre of gravity, um, faster than the escape velocity of the planet. And you know how difficult it is to get a spaceship into orbit around the Earth? <laughs> or magnify that problem by the entire mass of the Earth, and then you're getting about right as the amount of energy that you would actually need. So, um, yeah, so that's one way. So, I mean, yeah, so Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, of course, they, they destroyed um, the entire Earth. Um, and they, <laughs> because, you know, because we need to have a hyperspace bypass, which is extremely important. Um, and to anybody asking, you know, why, why, why would you need a bypass built? Uh, it's, well, you, you've got to build bypasses, you know, <laughs> it's important. Um, has, you know, if you ask anybody in any country around the world, why, why, why do we need this bypass? Your local planning council will always answer with, well, you, you, you've got to build bypasses, that's, that's, that's what you do. And um, yeah, it's no different in space. If you need to have a hyperspace expressway through a particular part of the galaxy, then yeah, I'm afraid you, you've got to build a bypass. So all planets in that, in that, in that zone of destruction have to be destroyed. Uh, because because it you know it, it's important to do so. So, um, um, a cutting oh, uh, Jason. So a cutting beam capable of drilling through the crust into the core in order to suddenly release those. Well, the problem with that is it would simply collapse in on itself again. If you make a if you make a void in a planet, if you could make a void in a planet, then the pressure around the edge. It's like it's like digging a dig a big hole. It simply just caves in. It would cave in instantly. Um, so the, the the gravitational pull of all the material would simply would seal the gap. So you need to you need to just put a massive amount of energy in to destabilize the planet. And there's 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 nothing that you can easily see how you would funnel that sort of energy into the Earth. Fortunately, because somebody would probably try it. Um, it isn't the Large Hadron Collider as we've discussed. So you know, so yeah, you know, a natural phenomena that would do it probably is a supernova at point blank range. Now, the sun isn't capable of going into a supernova um, because it's not big enough. So we don't, we can't, we can't have a supernova in the, st in the solar system because the sun isn't a big enough type of star to make a supernova. So that's not, that's not possible. Um, when the sun dies, um, or it gets into its old age, it will swell up to be a red giant um, star. Now that may, may actually destroy the Earth because the sun's atmosphere will be so big and so distended. It may, in fact, actually reach to the orbit of the Earth. Um, and as a result of that, um, the Earth may hit the atmosphere of the sun. Now, the atmosphere of the sun at that point will be quite distended and quite thin, but it will be enough over hundreds of years to slow the Earth down and it will fall into the sun and it will then be consumed by the sun. So that is a plausible way to destroy a planet, but you have to wait a long, long time <laughs> for that to happen, several billion years. Um, uh, and that will ultimately destroy the planet. That is possibly the likely fate of the Earth, ultimately, is that the sun will go into its red giant stage, loads and loads of heat will come out, everything on the Earth will be irradiated, mostly by infrared, really. Um, and you know the, the oceans will boil, the atmosphere will ultimately boil off into space. You'll be left with this rocky 
um, remains of the earth, which eventually will then be consumed by the sun. That will destroy the earth, but it will take a long, long time to do it. Um, you know, billions of years in the future before that can happen. Now, is there a way to make a star do that uh, prematurely? Um, you'd have to siphon off all the hydrogen in the star somehow <laughs> to do that, which is certainly in the realms of science fiction. Um, you know, if you could, if you could make a star go nova or go into its red giant stage early or, or anything like that, if you could trigger a late stage evolution of a star, um, that would definitely cause some difficulties for anybody in that solar system. Um, a planet around a star going supernova may or may not survive the experience. Um, we've got some tentative evidence actually that there are still planets in existence around supernovas. Um, and yes, yeah, Survivor says it's not really destroying it, it's more like waiting. <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> uh, convert the so, and somebody's mentioned red matter. So that was, that was of course, one of the Star Trek reimagined films, wasn't it? Where red matter allows you to sort of generate, spontaneously generate a black hole, um, um, you know, <laughs> kind of out of nothing. I'm not quite sure how red matter was supposed to work. Um, for some reason, the, I think the Romulans missed a trick on this one because in, in Star Trek, was it, is that the original Star Trek film? It is, isn't it? It's the new one. Um, and, um, you know, they, they have to drill a hole rather implausibly in the planet Vulcan in order to drop the red matter in. And then when they, when they do that, they drop the red matter in and it consumes the planet Vulcan and turns it into a black hole. Um, um, I don't know why the Romulans bothered with the drill, to be honest, because if you drop a black hole and just leave it at the surface of the planet, it's gonna be absolutely, utterly devastating <laughs> to the planet. You don't need to drill a hole and put the black hole at the center, you just leave it on the surface. Or even close by, you know, it doesn't need to be very far away. Um, and the black hole will, will do its thing and completely obliterate the planet. So, you know, if you could generate a black hole yourself in some fashion, um, quite how you would stop it ripping apart you and your spaceship and all the instruments used just to create the black hole in the first place, I'm not entirely sure. But um, if you could somehow contain, you know, prevent yourself from being sucked into the, the black hole that you've just created, leaving that anywhere near a planet would... would <laughs> would be absolutely devastating. It would, would, would completely rip the planet apart within presumably minutes, I'd have thought. So, uh, so and I didn't quite understand. I remember watching Star Trek at the time going, why are they going to the trouble to drill a hole? <laughs> um, and it's a good plot device. Yeah, so there we go. So red matter is a good plot device. Um, the other thing that bothered me about that is they, they, they threw away quite a few more of the laws of physics than is even normal for Star Trek in the sense that if you put a black hole at the center of something, um, and I presume it was a relative, at least it started out as a relatively low mass black hole. It can't have been a very big one. Uh, and it sucks the entire planet Vulcan down into obviously nothing because that's what a black hole is. You've now got a planetary mass black hole sitting there. Um, and, you know, on board the Enterprise, all the alarms are going off, you know, oh, near a black hole, how terrifying. It's like, well, actually, it wouldn't be because <laughs> you're not changing the mass. And you're not changing the distance that you are away from said mass. So the Enterprise will quite happily sit in orbit around this new black hole uh, where the planet Vulcan was uh, without any any issues at all, because there'd be the same amount of gravity there as there was before. <laughs> that didn't make sense either. Um, so let's not analyze that one too much. If you could, if you could generate a black hole, that would be a very, very good way of destroying a planet, um, I'm, I'm sure. Um, uh, maybe, maybe, you need, maybe you need magic. Ma <laughs> if you've got magic, I think you could probably do anything you like. So that, that's a good way of, of destroying the planet. Just <laughs> was it, wiggle your nose. There you go. That, 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 there's a way of destroying the planet. Um, so um, <laughs> best way to destroy a planet, says Commander, is let my ex-wife drive it for a few miles. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, so um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Black hole, black hole would be a good way. Supernova at point blank range would probably be pretty devastating. Red, uh, red giant stage of your star, that would be quite a bit of it. Um, if you've, I mean, actually to take Sophia's point, if you've got an awfully long time, okay, if you've got an awfully long time, you could, you could just do the, you know, you could just do the half life of a planet because atoms, everything's, um, as my, my, my son has a t-shirt that says, don't believe, um, don't believe anything an atom says uh, because they make up everything. <laughs> But there's, there's a kernel of truth in that. You see, an atom does have a half-life. Atoms don't last forever. So if you've got an infinite amount of time to waste um, just observing the Earth, you could, 
you could just wait until the atoms themselves disintegrate and go back into the fabric of the universe and become energy. Now that would that would take several you know several thousand million times the age length of the universe has existed um, again. <laughs> so it's for those of you who really like watching paint dry. This this would this would be your thing. I mean, you could wait you know billions upon billions of years and wait for the atoms in the Earth to degrade. <laughs> and disintegrate uh, and then and then obviously the planet would be gone so uh, you unfortunately probably would have gone as well because you're composed of the same material but um, that 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 that's for those of you who like a long game and, and just like watching things uh, that's that's a way that that would destroy a planet just wait <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so a true solution to destroying a planet, the fictional story, is just to destroy the plot of the story using logic and science. <laughs> it's not possible. So yeah. <laughs> well, I like I, I do like plausible science fiction that doesn't stress these things too far. I, I mean, I must admit, I do I I do tend to pick plot holes and things, as you know. Um, so, but there, you know, so there, if you want to destroy life on a planet, okay, so that that's that's definitely something that's quite 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 feasible to do. If you actually want to destroy a planet, you're going to have to put a lot more effort in. <laughs> you're going to need to you know, you're going to need to get out of bed early that day. And go, right, okay, I want to destroy the planet. Okay, not just the life on the planet. You want me to destroy the entire planet? Um, so if you ever get approached, okay, by you know some you know I don't know nefarious organisation, and you fancy being the evil overlord, do check the small print of your contract because if it says yeah, where it says destroy the planet, yeah, if you're signing up to that, that's that's hard. If it just says destroy all the life on the planet, much, much easier. Okay, so do check the fine print as to what you're signing up for. If you are signing up to be a dastard, the evil overlord of the universe, uh, make sure <laughs> make sure you check the fine print, okay? Uh, what would be the motive of destroying a planet? Well, I mean, what, what's the motive for destroying anything? Uh, <laughs> Because it's there, because because they're the bad guys, because because um, um, they, they they didn't believe in the same color blue as we do, you know. <laughs> um, I don't know what's the motive for destroying anything. Um, yeah, you could you could definitely. Um, well, oddly enough, I do think the expanse. You know, for those of you who haven't seen the expanse, minor spoilers, but the expanse is set in a. In a, in a science fiction future that isn't too far ahead of where we are now, maybe a few hundred years. I'm not quite sure exactly when it's set. Uh, and we're all inside, at least in the first episode, the first season, we're all inside the solar system and we have civilizations on the Earth and we have civilizations on Mars. We have civilizations, I think, in the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and we have civilizations in the asteroid belt. And, and they've all become political entities of themselves. So rather like today we have you know, East versus West and US versus China and Middle East and Russia and all these sort of political entities on the Earth. In the expanse, you basically you've, they've just kind of taken some of the same politics and just spread it across the solar system instead. So you have, you know, the Martians hate the Earthlings and the Belters are sort of stuck in between the two and they don't like anybody, as far as I can work out. Then you've got the people who are far away in the moons of Jupiter, um, feeling a bit kind of aggrieved at the, you know, the, the the fact that the Earth is very dominant in space politics, etc., etc., etc. And you know, you can see a plausible situation. Right, let's let's just destroy Mars because they're the bad guys, you know, or, or the Martians want to destroy Earth because they're the bad guys. Um, and um, so, um, so, so, Glenn. Anyway, Glenn hasn't watched it all, so um, but <laughs> because to prove to Drew it can be done. Now, there's a good reason. We are going to destroy this planet. Why? Why are you going to destroy my planet? Well, there was this guy back in the 21st century who said it couldn't be done. We're going to prove him wrong, or to find, to find out whether it works. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if it's apocryphal. It probably is. It sounds like the sort of thing it is. But there was a they, they were talking when they were developing. I mean, maybe maybe historians of U.S. Um, history can tell me something on this. Is because um, I don't know, but um, <laughs> because they need to build a bypass. Exactly right. That's that's the real reason. Um, is when they were testing atomic bombs. They started off obviously with fission bombs. Um, you know, heavy, um, presumably uranium, in, enriched uranium, you know, big, big nuclear, nu nu nucleus, nuclear weapons. And then they switched back to fusion, didn't they? And they, they invented the hydrogen bomb um, and they were testing it in the atolls and various places around the Pacific. Um, oh, thank you very much for the cheer, Pastor Dan. Um, then um, there was 
um, I was told, and I've seen in a few articles, some concern that the testing of the hydrogen bomb would set the atmosphere of the Earth on fire. Um, and they sort of looked into this and went, well, let's let the bomb off anyway and see what happens. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. Um, <laughs> um, you know, part of me would be like, no, surely not. There's, there's no way they would consider doing anything that dangerous just to test a hydrogen bomb. Um, um, and, um, you know, but having seen human nature <laughs> over the over the years that I've lived, I can kind of see, yeah, well, it's, it's a calculated risk. Let's see what happens. <laughs> There's a danger of setting the Earth's atmosphere on fire. This is a bad idea. Don't do that. Um, so I don't know. Is that is that is that true that um, they weren't lucky? Luigi says they weren't sure if the Trinity test bomb would set the atmosphere on fire, but they did it anyway. <laughs> what kind of people are these guys? If that's true, I mean, it's like, so what's the upside? Well, we learn a little bit more about nuclear physics and uh, and and how to build a really really big bomb. Okay, well that sounds like something what that's worth knowing. Okay, what's the downside? Well, there's a possibility that we'll set fire to the entire atmosphere of the planet and wipe out everything on it. That's quite a big downside. <laughs> is it? Is it really justified? Do we really need to know about these bombs so much that we would risk setting the entire planets on fire? <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> One of the Druze ancestors told them it wouldn't work. So they had, they had, yeah, there's, there's, there's this guy we know. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, we don't know for sure it would set the atmosphere on fire, so it shouldn't stop us trying. <laughs> yeah. Well, no one would. Com that is a very good point, Killers. No one would complain. Um, they they might complain for brief moments when the atmosphere was on fire. I think I think, I think some of us might notice that. Um, but it's only a point. It's only a million to one chance. <laughs> yeah. Come on, but million to one chances in science fiction. That's not good odds, is it? I mean. That <laughs> There are some dudes on Mars who would probably take exception to the million to one jump. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. That doesn't. That, that to me doesn't seem like a particularly great risk. I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, we haven't detonated bombs since, I and mean, we have to. We've had the uh, the nuclear ban treaty ever since, haven't we? Um, um, which which has stopped those sort of things. But um, um, if we don't test it, we won't know. <laughs> Knowledge, yeah. Um, so, but. It's, <laughs> Seems like a strange. It's great odds. People play the lottery or worse odds. I suppose that's true. Yes, they do actually, don't they? Yeah. Um, uh, there would be a great tremor in the force. Never tell me the odds, says Man vs. <laughs> um, it's the same with the Large Hadron. I don't know how. I don't know if there's a realistic danger of the Large Hadron Collider, yeah, obliterating the Earth. I mean, I suppose there's a chance it could unleash some hitherto unknown type of physics on us that we don't that we don't know anything about. Um, but um, yeah, so so. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. Um, there's a small chance. Uh, I think you overestimate their chances. I don't think you do. Uh, that, see, it's that sort of thinking that leads to the destruction of big, big, big assets like the Death Star. Okay, no, no, you overestimate their chances. Well, actually, it's not as good as you think it is. Um, so I don't know, but um, anyway, it would take. It would, to be honest, it. Um, from what I understand, it would take quite a lot of nuclear bombs to obliterate the surface of the planet. Now, I'm not sure. I mean, certainly at the end of the 80s, because I remember being at school at the end of the 80s, and uh, we were always being told we were on the verge of nuclear annihilation. We we, we did have drill. I mean, but imagine, I don't know if this was the same across the rest of, rest of the world, but in the UK at school, I remember us having three minute warnings. And um, it was a case of, you know, if we do get um, a notice of um, uh, uh, presumably Russian. I assume it was the Russians who were going to destroy us. Um, uh, you know, if we did get the warning of a, a Russian nuclear strike on the UK, we had three minutes before the <laughs> before the deadly radiation obliteration would hit us. Um, and because we lived, I mean, I, I grew up in Ashford which is about 65 miles away from the centre of London. And we assume London would probably be a likely target. And there's also a nuclear power station um, on the coast, not far away from where I live, uh, which would almost certainly also be a nuclear strike target as well. So we were sort of sandwiched in between those two. And the chances of us getting hit by a nuclear strike then seemed relatively high. But we were, we, we actually had drills at my school, um, you know, to, 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 <laughs> to run into a bunker. 
<laughs> to live out our last three minutes of life while we're waiting for this nuclear strike. And I'm not quite sure what the purpose of this three minutes was. It's a, what are you supposed to do with three minutes? <laughs> what are you supposed to do in the bunker after the nuclear strike has happened, assuming you survive? Um, so <laughs> and we did, we I don't know if other people in the UK did this, but we, we, we definitely had, and the problem, the problem we had kind of in the UK was a sort of, well, if the Americans decide to attack Russia or the Russians decide to attack America, we've got a lot of nuclear um, missiles you know, kind of stationed in the UK on behalf of the Americans. <laughs> so we're sort of, the UK was sort of this sort of floating missile base off the coast of Europe, which gave, us the, you know, gave the Americans a chance to shoot at the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> or the USSR, should I say, uh, as it was at the time. Um, so yeah, so I'd <laughs> we would we would probably be obliterated quite well. So <laughs> it's the nuke drill. We did. We generally. I'm looking back at it now, thinking <laughs> climbing into a small bunker <laughs> next to the school um, is it wasn't, and there wasn't enough room for all the classes. So the funny thing was, we took turns. It's like, okay, so when, when there's a real nuclear strike, which which class is going to be the one that gets to go in the bunker? <laughs> Nobody ever answered these questions. We were told to shut up and just do the drill. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, if, if a nuclear strike is coming, you've got three minutes to react and, and I don't know, do, <laughs> what do you do in three minutes? Um, I mean, do you have a cigarette? Do you, <laughs> what do you do? Um, yeah, or do you just have a snooze or... <laughs> Do you ring people up? Um, I don't know. So there we go. You, I suppose there's quite a lot you can do in three minutes if you put your mind to it. But boil an egg, the Cleonomus says. That was that was always a thing. You can boil an egg in that three minutes. Um, so I'm <laughs> not sure what that was all about. Um, and then it sort of faded away into the 90s. Now, um, I think we hit our peak in the number of nuclear weapons that humanity at large was able to deploy. I think possibly at the end of the 80s into the 90s. And then after that, we did manage to sort of trim them down a bit um, which you know which was probably a good thing um, all things considered um, but I don't know today if we've got enough nuclear weapons I mean who knows right I mean <laughs> it's presumably classified information uh, I don't know if we've nowadays got enough nuclear weapons to obliterate the surface of the planet we probably have to be honest um, but um, and and that would be a that would that would be a bad way because if you didn't get to if you didn't get to die in the nuclear bombs which is probably the best way to go because you're not again you're not going to really know a great deal if a nuclear bomb goes off next door to you um, this it's you know the radioactive fallout wouldn't be very pleasant the nuclear winter afterwards would be even worse um, and so it, you know it wouldn't be very much fun to survive in in those kind of scenarios because it would be a sort of long lingering painful way to you know, kind of end your life so I, I wouldn't recommend that at all. Um, um, I always let my teacher know when a nuke comes I'm getting my game by back. <laughs> I suppose you could do a couple of rounds of Mario Kart that would be quite good um, while the government would have you uh, shot on site if you're on the road while they were sitting in or then way to a nuke well um, you have to be very careful about the secret nuclear bunkers actually uh, in the I don't know about other countries but in the UK all the top secret nuclear bunkers are carefully signposted <laughs> from the main roads with signs that read um, top secret nuclear bunker <laughs> just off the A28. Um, so a command dealer system has actually done some research. There we go. That's what we need. 3,750 active nuclear warheads and 13,890 totally nuclear warheads in the world. So, uh, you know, that's probably enough to do quite a lot of damage still, isn't it? Um, so if we are stupid and accidentally help one of those, that's that's quite a good way to zap all the higher life forms on the planet. But again, the tardigrades um, and all the bacteria and stuff would probably survive all that as well. Um, <laughs> three minutes is enough time to strike an amusing pose for posterity. Yep. So that's that's good. why you would want to survive a nuclear war. I'm not quite sure. I can't imagine it'd be very pleasant. Um, yeah, living on the other side of a nuclear war. Um, so so there we go. So um, destroying a planet. Destroying a planet, in summary, to, to sort of summarise this very, very cheerful stream. <laughs> um, destroying a planet, quite hard, actually, quite hard. Um, you know, you have to put a lot of effort into destroying a planet. Um, you know, a, a small asteroid isn't going to be enough. You're going to need a fairly chunky asteroid or a small moon to actually destroy the planet entirely. Um, or at least rearrange it so much that it looked completely enough different um, to, to what it did before. Um, 
you know, if you completely want to obliterate the material the planet's made from, you need to provide enough energy that it will overcome the entire planet's mass gravitational field, which is quite a lot. Um, a star exploding will probably do it. Um, and as we discussed, a you know, the red, uh, red giant stage of the Earth's sun may do that in a few billion years' time. But actually destroying it um, with some sort of weapon would seem to be pretty tough, a pretty tough assignment. You'd need an awful lot of energy. And the problem with you know, managing all that energy, this is one thing that they, I mean, they sort of give pay a lip service in Star Wars to, um, you know, the fact that it's got an exhaust port. But, you know, we've got a planet killing weapon capable of generating enough firepower to destroy a planet, and it's got an exhaust port that's two meters wide. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Um, so, you know, to channel that much energy and not have so much heat that you actually vaporize the, your weapon, uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive as well. So they've got some very clever cooling stuff on the Death Star to keep that stuff cool. Um, so, so that's the, and and some of the stuff we haven't even covered. Okay, so I mean, so if we if we, we if we don't worry about um, you know destroying the actual physical planet, we just worry about destroying all the life on it. Um, yeah, you know, you've got you've got other things like the um, uh, the grey goo problem, which is which is a particularly interesting problem, I think. Um, the grey goo problem is that if we invent self-replicating von Neumann machines or von Neumann machines. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce that surname actually. Von is it von Neumann or von Neumann? Um, if you can if you can create self-replicating machines um, and and you're also able to miniaturize them um, so that you know, you know kind of like nano nanobots that sort of thing um, you know nanotechnology that sort of thing if you can create those and they self-replicate and then basically decide to dis dismantle everything. <laughs> absolutely everything at the kind of biological level um, you end up with a planet that's merely grey goo <laughs> everything is a homogenous nothingness i.e. just base materials um, and you know there's a, there's a possibility that a nanotech a nano swarm could um, it is Neumann is it um, then you know then then you know some future technological breakthrough will render us completely um, you know we'll basically get disassembled at the molecular level <laughs> So rather than destroying the planet, you get you'll get a smooth billiard ball of a planet, um, actually, if 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 that happens, because the the von Neumann machines will just basically dismantle anything, um, according to some you know some program. So Prey, yeah, there's a good book if you haven't read it. Prey by Michael Crichton touches upon this 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 idea, and that that's quite a good story actually. So that's definitely worth checking out. Um, um, Alan, Alan's worked out, there we go, I worked out the kinetic energy of Ceres going around the sun is many millions of times the annual energy output of humanity. That, that doesn't surprise me actually, because you know, um, there's a lot of energy there, so um, so that's good. Commander Buffer Zone, evening Drew, yes, all very well. It is, it is Neumann, okay, thank you Tuplex. So you know, so Lucky Luigi says that, that maybe that's the way we'll all end up. And you know, there, there is also the, un, um, you know, the unfettered use of technology um, yeah, we, 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 we unleash something that we, we don't, um, you know, we're not aware of. I mean, we could wipe ourselves out by simply AI. It could be technology. You know, that, when we get into the Skynet aspect of science fiction, whereby our future uh, selves are so good at technology that we invent sentient machines, which basically look at the, look at the state of everything and go, nah, humanity is the problem. Let's get rid of them. <laughs> and then we'll have utopia. Um, and... Um, the, the, the intelligent machines that we create decide that we're no longer good enough to live in the same existence as them and they destroy us. And there's, you know, there's plenty of good science fiction that kind of looks at that as well. So there's a lot of ways for us to wipe ourselves out in the, in the context of science fiction. So um, easy, relatively easy to envisage life being destroyed by natural disaster or by some kind of technological influence. You don't need to do much to a planet to render it uninhabitable. Uh, for you know, for for big multicellular creatures like us, so that's that, that's well within the bounds of possibility. We could probably do that to ourselves today, um, you know, if if we were having a mad five minutes. Um, but to actually destroy a planet, that's much, 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 much more difficult. You know, several orders of magnitude difference um, to actually destroy a planet. Planets are big things, and there's there's a lot of mass you need to deal with there. So. Um, <laughs> the internet didn't destroy intelligent social media. It always chuckles me actually with um, you know that thing about um, um, that's, one, that's one of the things. I mean, I must admit, um, looking at the world around us today, um, you know, with, with all of its you know with all of its schisms and all of its polarization, all these sort of things, I you know I never thought when I was a younger man 
that um, um, you know, you know, uh, well, let me put it around the other way. I always thought when we when I was younger, I thought, well, hey, yeah, when we when we have all the information and we figured out what we need to do, then you know, there's going to be people arguing about the best way to solve the problem. You know, that's that's going to be that's going to be the that's going to be the big deal. So you know, we'll have established, okay, there's this there's this threat, there's an ex existential threat to our existence. What's the best way for us to counter this existential threat? You know, it, you know and I can see people arguing, no, that's you know. Option A, that's the best way to deal with this threat. B, that's the way, best way to deal with this threat. Option C, that's the best way to deal with this threat. That's how I thought it was going to work. That's not what's happened <laughs> in the world today. Basically, it's a case of um, is that there's this existential threat? No, there's not. <laughs> this is the right way to do things. No, it's not. <laughs> we need to do these things. No, we don't. <laughs> And then, yeah, so we spend nowadays all our time actually all arguing over whether whether there is actually a problem or not. Um, and, and everyone looks at the thing with different ideas, thinking actually some people think this is a problem, some people think this isn't a problem. Uh, and we can't agree whether things are problems or not. <laughs> all the while, whatever is actually happening is actually happening, uh, regardless of whether it's respecting our opinions or not. So we'll have to wait and see. But um, there we go. Um, Johnny Mnemonic took place yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Um, a butterfly flapping its wings, Medicor, uh, Medicon on the run. Uh, always wondered if in space everything EMs wind and gravity. How is it that everything would float out of um, float out of SM8, SM8, as massive as the Death Star? Um, not quite sure what you're saying there. Um, Medicon on the run, uh, but well, the, I don't think the Death Star's all that massive. On a planetary scale, I'm not sure how. I mean, it would have a gravitational field, obviously, but oh, something. Okay, sorry. Um, if space, uh, how is it that everything would float out of something as massive? As, you know, so the Death Star would have enough. It probably be big enough to have a gravitational field. I wouldn't have thought it was very large though, because it's presumably relatively hollow. So compared to a, you know, a moon of a similar size, it would probably be quite lightweight because it's mostly hollow inside. Uh, and it seems that the Star Wars universe uses. Um, sort of gravity plating and anti-gravity technology of some kind because everybody's walking around not on the surface and not orientated against the surface but kind of on like decks inside the Death Star so um, they've also got some kind of anti-gravity tech I think um, uh, people don't argue today they just yell statements to each other not listening I think <laughs> I think that's very true um, we, it is hard to solve a problem when we can't agree there's a problem that's the problem exactly right or is it <laughs> and if we eventually decide it is a problem, we stick to saying, yeah, it's really important we do something about it. <laughs> we do do a lot of talking nowadays, don't we? But we don't do... Um, as a friend of mine was fond of saying, when, when all is said and done, there's a lot more said than done. Uh, <laughs> and Star Wars is more fantasy than... You're quite right. So anyway, so hopefully one of these days we'll actually get to grips with what actually are the real problems and, and hopefully do something about them. That would be good. Um, but you know, rest easy, my friends. Rest easy. It is very difficult to destroy a planet. It's very unlikely that we'll be able to destroy a planet. Life, on the other hand, um, we may be able to wipe out quite straightforwardly. So I will leave you with that cheery thought for the evening. <laughs> so anyway, so I hope you've enjoyed the 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 um, science fiction fantasy space rambles, um, and um, you know. Uh, <laughs> It's been vaguely entertaining discussion on how to completely pulverize a planet. So thank you very much for all your contributions this evening. It's been very, very good. I enjoyed <laughs> enjoyed feeling those. Um, the inter the ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of a force. So yeah, so yeah, the force must be pretty damned impressive <laughs> if it's more than you know, the ability to destroy a planet. Um, too much management and not enough engineers. I have some sympathy with that view as well. Yep. Um, and not all around. Yeah, we let's just let's just take a moment to remember all around. Um, but anyway, um, lovely to chat with you all, my friends. Um, <laughs> you have a great week. Enjoy yourselves. Rest easy. Don't don't worry too much, Chris, about the um, you know the impending doom of the Earth. Uh, fairly unlikely, but um, um, there we go. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> we'll see. And we'll be back for another science fiction topic next week. Plenty more to go. So um, you know, do tune in for that, and we'll we'll go for that and see where it goes. Um, you guys have a fantastic week. I'm obviously back on Thursday uh, with my Elite Dangerous um, uh, story. 
uh, stuff that's going on. So if you're an Elite Dangerous Commander, make sure you tune into that and see what's going on and play your part in the story, of course. So that's always going to be good. And um, we'll crack on from there. Saturday is the retro stream with uh, Frontier Elite 2. So take care, my friends. Have a fantastic week. Um, look forward to catching up with you later on. And look after yourselves. And if at all possible, don't destroy the planet. All right? <laughs> I'll see you soon. Be good.